Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This show is sponsored by Wine Access. Go to wineaccess.com slash WFMP. Get 10% off your first order. And don't forget, the holidays are coming up and Wine Access has gift cards. What a great gift to get the wine lover in your life. Check it out today, wineaccess.com slash WFMP. Listen in the middle of the show for more details. All right, I'm going to confess something to you guys. This is the second time I'm recording this show. And this time I am doing it solo because I felt like upon listening to the first version that I did with MC Ice, it was not clear enough. And Sherry is a really confusing topic. So I just decided that it'd be better for me to redo it, do a very quick, clear spiel on Sherry, and then send you on your merry way. So I'm sorry that I have cut him out of this, but I do feel like we meandered a little bit And in this particular show where we're going through several things, it was better just for me to redo it because I was even confused by some of the things that we were talking about. That's not good. So where we last left off, we had done an overview of the history of the winemaking of the grapes of the terroir. I'm going to give you a very quick overview of the winemaking in particular. We're not going to go over the terroir or the history. You can go back and listen to part one. Sherry. Sherry is a white wine. It is aged and the system is as follows. Remember, grapes are picked. They are destemmed. They are, I'm probably going to give you a little bit more detail this time because we already went over the high level. So I'm going to give you a a few more details on the winemaking here. So they're crushed using a screw press, actually, which I don't think I mentioned last time. That's going to break the skin up and it's going to extract the juice. You put those crushed grapes into a stainless steel tank. Gravity and a little bit of pressure from the grapes themselves is going to make juice come out of the bottom into what is called the first press or the primera yema. That's 65% of the must, the grape juice with the seeds and some of the skins. And it is the purest juice, and it's destined for what they consider to be the finest sherries, fino, and manzanilla. And then there is a second press, just a little bit harder of a press. This is 23% of the must. It's called the segunda yema. This juice Because you're pressing, you're pressing the skins a little more, more structure, more color, more body. You can only use it for the Olorosos, which we will talk about this time. That's what we're concentrating on. After this process, winemakers might add some tartaric acid to bring the pH down make it more acidic, prevent bacterial spoilage. They might add sulfur dioxide, again, to prevent that bacterial spoilage, especially in white wines. That can be a problem. And then they're going to rack the wine. Racking the wine means you're going to take it and pump it off of the solids to clean it up. Then you're going to bring it into the fermentation tank in stainless steel. Mostly some people use oak, but most people use stainless steel in large stainless steel tanks. And you're going to start the fermentation. They used to use cultivated yeast. Now more indigenous yeast is being used. And you ferment it to dryness for the categories of wine that we're going to be talking about right now. During the end of fermentation, this layer of indigenous yeast starts to colonize on the surface. It's called the velo de flor, the flowering veil. It's really unique. It is a strain of Saccharomyces, the yeast that doesn't need sugar to survive, which is crazy. And it doesn't get killed by alcohol. It feeds off of the alcohol, off of the glycerin, also off of oxygen and off of the unfermentable sugars because there are some unfermentable sugars in wine. So if you keep a consistent temperature and humidity, we talked about the importance of the architecture of the bodega being part of terroir in sherry. The floor is going to reproduce. It's going to cover the wine. And then what you get is this very interesting situation because the floor is going to develop if it becomes thick on these very pale, delicate wines from the top vineyards, 
then it will be sitting under that floor. We will watch the floor develop. If it's going well, you'll fortify it to just about 15% alcohol. You'll mark it with a single slash that's called a palo. And that is for finos, or if you are in San Lucar de Barrameda, you will call that a manzanilla. If these wines are fuller and they're more structured or they're from the Segunda Yema, you're not going to need the flor. You're going to fortify them to 17% alcohol, and that is going to kill the flor because that's too much alcohol for the flor to exist. And then you are going to age them oxidatively. And those are marked with a circle, or you could think of it as an O. All the wines are put into 600 liter American oak barrels. They're only filled up to 500 liters. We've already talked about what happens with the biological aging. The floor continues to develop and the wine sits with the floor on top of it, which is going to protect it from the 100 liter space inside of the barrel. And it's just going to get a small amount of air transfer from the state, you know, through the staves in the barrel. Then there's oxidative. These wines have been fortified to 17%, and they have full exposure to 100 liters of free open space, plus all the oxygen coming in through the staves, they are going to go through the process of transpiration. The water in the wine is going to evaporate through the walls of the cask. You have a lot of air coming in. There's lots of space for that air, and the alcohol is going to start to concentrate because when you take water out of wine, what you're left with is a bunch of compounds and really the alcohol. As that oxidative aging happens, the wine's going to get darker. It can get to 20 or 22% alcohol by volume. The main wine that is aged oxidatively is called Oloroso. This is a wine that makes sense. It's going to concentrate with time because it's exposed to oxygen. It's going to get darker with age. These are all the things that you, when you try to keep a wine away from the air, you don't want it to darken, right? You don't want it to, to start browning like an apple that starts to turn brown. These wines are exposed to oxygen. They're going to get darker. And what you wind up getting here are these warm, nutty, toasty, balsamic, truffly, leathery notes. And the body of an Oloroso is full. There is more alcohol in it. It is more woodsy, and the influence of the air is going to create some of these toasty, nutty flavors. These wines are going to be served a little bit warmer, between 12 and 14 degrees Celsius, or 54 to 57 degrees Fahrenheit, in a white wine glass. You can leave it open for months, because it's been oxidatively aged. This is like Madeira, where you can leave it open for a really long time. It's already seen all the oxygen that it could possibly get. Once you open an Oloroso, you can keep it for several months and it'll still be good. In terms of what you should eat with it, it's good on its own with Marcona almonds, which I think every sherry goes with, incidentally. And with mushrooms, aged or smoky cheeses are recommended. And some people recommend red meat or game as something that can go with Oloroso. You'll have to try it and see what you think. These wines are pretty significant. They're pretty heavy. And they definitely have a lot more warmth to them versus a Fino or a Manzanilla. Regarding Fino and Manzanilla, I did not mention food pairings with them. So I just want to real quick say the traditional pairing with Fino is actually anchovies or salty fish, and also soups like gazpacho, mushroom soups, capers, things that are very salty. Manzanilla is the same, but manzanilla is usually sardines and anchovies, but also ricotta cheese is a popular pairing with manzanilla. Herbal dishes, because it has that chamomile note that we mentioned last time, jamón, Oysters, asparagus, those are things that will go well with manzanilla. And I would say oysters and asparagus probably will go well with fino as well. Manzanilla is really great with herbal things, though, because it has that herbal element. Anyway, that's food for those things. There are two other types of wines that are between the biological aging and oxidative aging. And I discussed them last time, but I want to give a bit more detail this time, just in case I wasn't as clear. Amontillado. Amontillado is our favorite wine. It is first classified as a Fino or Manzanilla made of the Palomino grape, made in the exact same way I described with the Finos or Manzanillas. And then it's fortified to 15% and it's aged under the veil of Flor for several years, actually. But then 
as the winemakers are looking at this, they're saying uh, the floor is not looking very good. It stops developing. Or the winemakers are tasting this wine destined for Fino or Manzanilla, and they say, you know what? This is not delicate enough to be a Fino or a Manzanilla. Forget it. Let's just fortify the wine to 17%, and then we're going to age it oxidatively. Amontillado is really interesting because it's been aged in both ways. It goes through both processes, first biological, then oxidative. So it is in multiple soleras. It's in multiple aging regimens. And so what it has are both characteristics of Fino or Manzanilla and also characteristics of Oloroso, which is kind of cool. So it's darker in color, definitely. A Fino or Manzanilla is straw yellow. This is amber in color, and it has characteristics of both. So you'll get herbs, you'll get nuts, tobacco, woodsy notes, toasty notes, spice. The wine is very smooth, smoother and rounder in the mouth than what you're going to get from a Fino or Manzanilla, but not quite as heavy as what you will get from an Oloroso. Now, depending on how much time they've spent under the floor, they might be more yeasty and sharp. If it's many more years that it's had exposure to oxygen, then they might be more woodsy or spicy. It just depends. And you have to read the tasting notes to see what they're kind of saying. Is it a little bit sharper or lighter or is it heavier? Occasionally, you might see a manzanilla a montiara, that means that it was once a manzanilla. You might see a Jerez, a montiaro, which means that it came from the Jerez de la Frontera. And you might see a montiaro del Puerto, which is from El Puerto de Santa Maria. I would say the only one that really, really matters is the manzanilla, because then if you like those chamomile notes, you might be looking for that in a, an amontiado, or in this case, a montiada. Food pairings for an amontiado. We've talked every time we talk about sherry, we talk about how we love the Trader Joe's Marcona almonds that are in olive oil with rosemary. I think there's nothing better with an amontillado than that. But you can also do grilled asparagus and garlic dishes, pate, white meats with herbs. So herbs are really great with this jamon, very traditional, mushrooms, really nice pairings. But if you just want a glass of amontillado with some nuts, I highly recommend it. It is awesome. Palo Cortado. This wine is really interesting. This is also first classified as a Fino or Manzanilla. It's made from the Palomino grape, pressed the same way, fortified to 15%, gets the Palo, the mark. During the Sobre Tablas phase, which we talked about in episode 495, it becomes clear to the tasters that these wines have some rare and excellent special characteristics that's going to make the most elegant sherry and the winemakers fortify the wine again to 17% and let it age oxidatively for the rest of its life. But because of the base material, these wines are much lighter than an Amontillado. They're a little more elegant. They're actually more like orange, marmalade. It's soft, very aromatic, floral. So it has some of the nutty round notes of an Oloroso because it's going to age oxidatively. But Palo Cortado is slightly different from an Amontillado because it has some of these orange buttery notes, which are quite different from what you'll find in an Amontillado, which is more like tobacco and woods and spice. It's fresh, but at the same time, it has a lot more depth. In the past, like when people used to talk about Palo Cortado, it was like, oh my gosh, this magical thing happens in the bodega and all of a sudden this Palo Cortado wine appears and it's like a thing from God. No, that's not what happens. Actually, the tasters usually say that's a really great batch from a really great place. And so here we go. We're going to make a Palo Cortado. Why is it called Palo Cortado? I mentioned the line that goes into a Fino or Manzanilla to classify on the barrel. Well, if you figure out that this is going to be a Palo Cortado, you cross the Palo. The Cortado is a cut across the Palo on the barrel. So that's where you get Palo Cortado, a cut line. Palo Cortado is pretty flexible. Manchego cheese, artichokes, prawns or shrimp in butter. Cured pork is actually a very classic pairing with Palo Cortado, but it is very flexible. Little different from an Amontillado, 
like I said, it might have more richness or it might be lighter. Again, read the tasting notes and see what people are saying about their particular Palo Cortado because people are looking for different characteristics. The only thing that I will say about the Palo Cortado is it does have orange blossom notes that you will not find in an Amontillado. So that's kind of the difference. Both Amontillado and Palo Cortado, these intermediate styles, are served between 12 and 14 degrees Celsius, 54 to 57 degrees Fahrenheit. They've already been exposed to oxygen. Remember, they're aged oxidatively. Open these wines. They can last for weeks and months, and you'll be fine. So a great investment to make if you want to keep trying it, see if you like it in a couple weeks. If you don't like it right away, it is an acquired taste. Let's talk about some styles of sherry. So the Consejo Regulador, which is the regulating body of Jerez, categorized sherry styles in a pretty easy to remember way and some way that I think will help you in thinking about sherry. Now, up to this point, we have only talked about one category of sherry, and that is the dry sherries made from the Palomino grape. That would be Fino, Manzanilla, Amontillado, Palo Cortado, and Oloroso. Most sherry is actually dry. These wines, by law, cannot have more than five grams per liter of residual sugar. That means that they will be perceived as dry to us. At Five grams is very, very little residual sugar. These wines are fermented completely dry and then fortified. The category of these dry sherries is called Vinos generosos, or just generosos. It starts with a G, G E N E R O S O S. Vinos generosos. So those are the dry sherries. That's what we've talked about. There are two other types of sherries. And these are the things that, as I was talking about sherry last week, I mentioned it a little bit. And as I was talking about just this last bit here, you might be thinking to yourself, but I thought that my grandmother or my mother or my some person that I used to know said that sherry was sweet. Why are you talking about dry sherry? Where are the sweet wines? Now we're going to talk about the sweet wines because there are two other types of sherries and they're made in different ways. And we'll start with the sweet wines, the vino dulces naturales, naturally sweet sherry wines. When I say that, you should be thinking, oh, that sort of sounds like some other naturally sweet wines, Vendu Naturel from France, because it is exactly the same. These are where the other two grapes from Sherry come into play, Moscatel and Pedro Jimenez. These wines are actually named for the grape. You will see Moscatel or Pedro Jimenez. They're not going to say Vinos Dulces Naturales. They're going to say Moscatel or Pedro Jimenez. They are made in one of two ways. Either they're late harvest, picked super ripe so that the concentration is there in the sugars, the water has come out of the grapes, or they go through a process called asoleo. That's where you dry the grapes on mats in the sun for several weeks, and that's going to convert the grapes into raisins. They're going to lose a lot of water, and then you're going to press them. There is so much sugar in these raisinated grapes that the yeast are going to struggle to complete fermentation. You're going to add alcohol. You will bring them up to 15%, 20% alcohol, and then you will have sugar left in the wine. The aging from that point on is oxidative, and it is also in Solera. These wines are Excellent. They're very, very sweet. So we'll talk about Pedro Jimenez first. This is considered to be the slightly classier wine than the Moscatel, to be quite honest. Pedro Jimenez is often called PX. So you actually might see PX on a menu. You have to know that that's Pedro Jimenez and that it is very sweet. So Pedro Jimenez, they have to be at least 85% of the grape. That's the rule in the EU to be called a PX. The base wines, interestingly for Pedro Jimenez, are a little different because there is a denominación de origen called Montilla Moriles. And that is just a kind of like the next town over from the Sherry Triangle. It is 
warmer and not so humid there. It's drier. If you are trying to dry grapes on the vine or you're trying to dry them in the sun, the last thing you want is humidity because as soon as you have that, you're going to start to have mildew and mold and rot and it's going to spread all over. So instead, they're going to grow them and dry them in Montilla Moriles. The Sherry Consejo Regulador has decided that the grapes can be grown in Montilla Moriles and then transferred to the bodegas in the Sherry Triangle in Jerez for maturing in the Solera, and they can still be labeled as Sherry. Because again, we're talking about the terroir of Sherry. It is only partially in the vineyard, but a lot of it has to do with the bodega. Alcohols for Pedro Jimenez, 15 to 22%. It's super, super dark and syrupy. It is like dried fruit, like figs and dates, and it smells a little bit like raisins, honey, coffee, also like a caramel coffee, licorice and dark chocolate and spice. And it goes so unbelievably well, I think as we talked about last time, over vanilla ice cream as a sauce. Really, really tasty. It's also great with chocolate. It has enough of an acidic note to it to balance the wine. If you let it age a little bit, the wine is then going to have more elegance. It's going to lose some of its vim and vigor. Then you might be able to have it with blue cheese. So that is Pedro Jimenez. You'd need to get the older wines. You'd either need to age it yourself or you'd need to get something that had a vintage on it. Moscatel. Moscatel, they have to be at least 85% of Moscatel. It is usually grown in the sherry towns of Chipiona or Chiclana de la Frontera, which has that arena soil type, which is good for Moscatel, not so good for Palomino. It is made using that same azuleo system where you're going to dry out the grapes. It's aged in a solera. If it's made using the dried grapes, it can say Moscatel de Pasas on it. It has been made with that dried grape system. Or it can be Moscatel Oro, which is aged for a shorter time and it's a little more floral and lighter in color. This is really a dessert wine, also aromatic, a little bit more floral. This is a Muscat grape, so it's going to have those Muscat notes. Jasmine, orange blossom, lime, honeysuckle. It might be a little bit raisined because we've dried the grapes out, but this is a Muscat-based wine, so you're going to get those nice, very floral, effusive notes that you'll find in any Muscat. Fruit and ice cream are the best pairings. This is really a dessert wine. I will say Pedro Jimenez is sweeter than Moscatel. You'll serve these wines at around 50 to 54 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 to 12 degrees Celsius, And they have been aged oxidatively. All of these wines go through this drying process or they are raisined on the vine and then they go through the oxidative process. So because of that, they can also be open for weeks or months. So that's great. If you have a dessert that you really like with Pedro Jimenez, but you're not going to drink the whole thing, although it does come in a smaller bottle, great thing because you can just stick it in the fridge and it can go the distance. I would also recommend that with the other wines, Amontillado, Palo Cortado, and Oloroso, store it in the refrigerator. It'll keep it better for a long period of time if you don't drink it right away. We'll take a step away from the podcast to thank our sponsors this week, Wine Access. Go to wineaccess.com slash WFMP. Check out the selections on my page. Go into the site. See all the fantastic wines that they have. They've got free shipping when you reach $150 threshold, which is really not hard to do. And if you hit that, you save so much money on the shipping. It is spectacular. Another thing, holidays are coming up. We should start to think about, okay, well, what do we want on our tables so that we can start ordering those wines? But in addition, what are great gifts for wine lovers in our lives? I mentioned last week, wine access gift cards. What a fantastic way to give your business associates or your friends, wine lovers in your life, or even ask for one, a wine access gift card. A lot of people give wine. They might give wine to you, but maybe they don't know exactly what you like. A wine access gift card is a perfect way to sort of personalize and say, look, this is a site where stuff is highly curated, definitely 
definitely find amazing wines here. It's a great present because it's thoughtful because you have gone to this very specialized site. And at the same time, it's something that gives somebody some free choice, which is always really nice. Wineaccess.com slash WFMP. Make sure you go to my special URL. You'll get 10% off your first order. You'll let them know their support of the podcast is worth it. They are our exclusive sponsor and they are a key part of keeping us going. So please support them as they support us. And you can also support us directly by joining Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash wine for normal people. There are so many reasons to join Patreon, not the least of which is that your support means that we can keep the podcast going and keep having these great conversations about awesome wines. You get to know people in the community. We will be doing mini classes. We will be doing hangouts. It is a really, really great community of people. And for those of you who have joined, I have nothing but thanks. Really appreciate it. It keeps me independent. I do not have to sell out. I don't have to take money from wineries because of Patreon. So I am hugely grateful to you. Patreon.com slash wine for normal people. And also we are winding down the year. There is the wines of Burgundy. The food and wine pairing class is almost full. And then we will be launching a sparkling class, which is an annual class. I'm not going to be teaching too much in December. And then we were going to be starting up again with live classes in January. Wine for normal people.com slash classes. Make sure you check back in on a regular basis as you're looking for gifts either to add ask for or to give, you can get a Wine for Normal People gift certificate good for classes. Wineforormalpeople.com slash classes. And now let's get back to the show. The last category is the one that I hate to be the stereotyping person here that was very popular in the 1950s. And it was really Harvey's Bristol Cream which started in the 1860s, that made this very thick, sweet sherry. And since the 1950s, Harvey's Bristol Cream has been the top-selling sherry in the world, although it's now losing ground to the drier wines. But it used to be huge in the UK and Germany especially. So that idea of sherry being sweet comes from this category, which are called vinos generosos de licor. These are blended wines. You take the Generoso wines, the dry wines, and you either blend them with the dulces, the naturally sweet wines, or you blend them with something that's called concentrated grape must. So the better quality wines in this category are going to be blends of those dry wine styles that we talked about before with the vino dulces. But lesser quality cream sherries are made with something called concentrated rectified grape must. Now, it is made from grapes. It's the sugar and the juices that come from these sweeter grapes. You can either use them for color or you can use them for this cooked down caramelized grape must called arope. But either way, they are sweet. And of course, they are a lot cheaper than going through the whole Solera process and making a vino dulce natural. There are three types of these wines. You have pale cream sherry, medium sherry, and cream sherry. Pale cream sherry is made from biologically aged wines. The base is either the fino or the manzanilla sherry. Then you're going to add vino dulces naturales or concentrated must for sweetness, and the wine will go to between 45 and 115 grams of sugar per liter. That is a huge amount of sugar. So because the pale cream sherry is made with fino and manzanilla, and because we are trying to keep this lighter color of the original wine, usually they actually prefer to use the vino dulces naturales. They would prefer to use that for pale cream because if you use the rectified grape must, it is very dark often, and that's going to ruin the color for the pale cream sherry. Now, pale cream sherry, these are wines that were aged under the floor. So you are going to get those hazelnut and yeasty doughy notes. It's lighter, but it can be very, very sweet. These wines should be served cold between 7 and 9 degrees Celsius or 45 to 48 degrees Fahrenheit. They will be pale in color. That's why they're called pale cream sherries. 
medium sherries. Medium sherries are usually based on Amontillado wines. They can have some Oloroso added in as well. And you blend it the same way that I said for pale cream sherry, either with Pedro Jimenez or Muscatel or with that grape must. Medium ranges enormously because you can have a near dry medium sherry. So it's anything above five grams per liter of sugar, which would then no longer qualify for the vinos generosos, but it can go up to 115 grams of sugar per liter. If it has less than 45 grams of sugar per liter, it's going to say medium dry sherry. If it has more than 45 grams per liter, it is going to say medium sweet sherry. These, for the most part, are like the Amontillado. They're darker in color, nutty. They're going to have baked fruit. But because of that sugar, you might get more like a baked apple, baked pear, sweet pastry, sweet apple pie kind of note, maybe minus the cinnamon. It can be very, very, very sweet. It might be able to go with a creamy curry or something like that. But again, a lot of people just have it by itself. Then we have the cream sherry. Cream sherry is also sweet. It is made only from wines that are aged oxidatively, mainly from Oloroso. If we think about a pale cream is Fino or Manzanilla, medium is Amontillado, maybe with a little bit of Oloroso, and cream, the base is Oloroso. And then again, you either use the Vino, vino Dulces Naturales of Pedro Jimenez, cream sherries, you don't usually use Moscatel, it's mostly Pedro Jimenez, or you can use that concentrated grape must. And sometimes, for this very reason, it is called sweet oloroso. It has to be more than 115 grams per liter of sugar. The sweetest of all of these wines, it's dark, it's syrupy, it's like caramel. It's all of the things of the oloroso, yet that edge of an oloroso has been softened by sugar it's soft. It's very, very long in the finish, and it's sweet, but it is nutty with caramel notes. The way that cream sherry is traditionally served is chilled. They often put a slice of orange in it, and it's served between 50 and 54 degrees Fahrenheit. You're pretty much good for that with medium sherries as well. There's also another type of sherry called East India sherry. This is named after the tradition of maturing wines in ships that went to the East Indies. This is just like Madeira. Creates a softer style of sherry, lots of oxidative aging. Today, they blend Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso, and they store it in the warmest parts of the bodega. Basically, it is their version of Madeira, to simplify it. Different grapes, obviously, so a little bit different, but still very similar in production. If you want to pair things with these Vino Generoses de Licor, you're going to be looking at maybe fruit salads or apple pie, other kinds of pastry. You can have it after dinner. You can have it with aged cheeses, things like that. So that's cream sherry. When we think about cream sherry, that's like those old-fashioned little tiny sherry glasses that they used to serve in intermission in theaters and stuff like that, or the stuff that I think my mom used to keep around the house. It was kind of dark. She must have had medium sherry. I can't remember what it was, but I remember it was dark and it smelled really bad to me and was super sweet. And she always served it in these tiny little sherry glasses. One other category and then I'm going to send you on your way. And these are aged sherries. So in the year 2000, the Consejo Regulador created two special categories of sherry wines of certified age. Since Fino and Manzanilla really are meant to be consumed young and we're supposed to drink them fresh, they are not part of this category. What is are the Amontillados, the Olorosos, Palo Cortado, and then also Pedro Jimenez. Muscatel is not included in this. There are two acronyms. They were actually Latin, but they translate very well to English. The first is VOS, standing for, in Latin, Venum Optimum Signatum, wine selected as optimal. Of course, in English, we have named it Very Old Sherry, VOS. And these wines are 20 years or more in the Solera. And then there is V-O-R-S, Venum Optimum Rare Signatum, or Very Old Rare Sherry. And these are wines that 
are selected as optimal and exceptional, and they are 30 years or older, so VOS and VORS. Less than 1% of all sherry on the market gets VOS or VORS as a label. And there's quotas for how much is permitted to be made. Tasters decide what should be aged with the special qualities of the wine. Is it going to be able to go the distance? And then they will put it in these older Soleras. Some of the Soleras are as old as the bodega. So they're from the 17 and 1800s. Crazy. Hundreds of years old. Really great quality. All the wines are sort of blended over the course of time because sherry is a blended product within the Solera. So these Soleras are very old. It used to just be for family members who kept these very old rare wines, but now they do sell them. It's classified off the individual batches of the wine. So they do the saka, they take out the wine, and then they classify them based just on that batch of wine in the specific bodega. So it's it's a very teeny portion of production, but I thought I should mention it because you might see it on a bottle. The Consejo Regulador has to approve it. If you only approve about 80% of the wines, it's a very difficult process to approve because the Solera is a mixture of hundreds of wines, especially if you have these old Soleras from 30 years you're going to have 30 separate vintages passing through these wines, and the mix over the course of time is going to be incredibly complex. It's really hard to tell how old the wine is. So they use lab testing, carbon dating in some cases. It's very difficult to approve. The other thing is that they require a certain amount that you hold in the back stock in order to make the wine VOS or VORS. So smaller sherry bodegas really can't participate in this. It's kind of frustrating to help them get some certification or some acknowledgement. They do have a special certification project for sherries that are 12 to 15 years old. They can get certification and it's a little less strict. But really those VOS and VORS are only for the big bodegas that have a lot of money and a lot of storage space. We mentioned also there are vintage sherries. Those are a little bit different. That is the end of our sherry trip. We have our history and terroir and all of the winemaking. In the last episode, we talked about the biological aging. This time, review with oxidative aging, the Olorosos. We talked about the in-between styles again, just for clarification of the Amontillado and the Palo Cortado. And then Vino Generosos, which are the dry sherries made from Palomino. Vino Dulces Naturales, these naturally sweet sherry wines, which are Pedro Jimenez and Moscatel. And then these wines that you may have heard of, the blended wines, Vino Generoso de Licor, which are the pale cream sherries, medium sherry, East India sherry, cream sherry. And those are some of the more well-known sherries from back in the day. Now we have these aged sherries, and that's pretty much the overview of sherry. I do want to say something. I love this community so much. I know I say it all the time. But patron Chaim G, who is in Israel, we pray for Chaim's safety and the safety of his family. He sent me something from Lustau. Lustau is a very large sherry producer. They're very involved in the regulations and also very involved in education. There are regulations actually that were announced in July of last year and just finally approved. None of this information, and it's part of the reason I didn't find it, I was on the Consejo Regulador's site looking at all of the sherry information. They have not updated any of the content on their official website. I think they're waiting to see what happens because some of these changes that are going to come down are going to be very, very small. I do want to mention them, just in case you hear them in passing. They do not materially change anything I've just said about Sherry, but here's the deal. First of all, they have expanded the growing zone. Most notably, there's a municipality that used to be part of Jerez and then broke away and then wasn't allowed to use Sherry anymore. It's called San Jose del Valle. There's going to be that and then a couple of other areas that are included. It could lead to some different styles, but right now it only includes 10 bodegas. Also, now you can put a pago, an estate, or a vineyard on the label if it contains 85% of grapes from that specific pago or estate. It's 
a newer thing. Only since 2015 did the Consejo Regulador have a map of all the Pagos. Now that they have that map, you can apply for certification. There's no guarantee you're going to get it. Also, Heveth Superior, which I did not mention, I probably should have mentioned when we're talking about production, is you've got the regular Denominación de Origen, which is within the PDO, the Protected Designation of Origin. And then there is another sort of sub area, Heveth Superior. And this is within that production zone, vineyards that are planted on Albariza soil. Ideally, it's saying that these are better for wines. You can put it on the label if they are from the Albariza soil. They are now expanding that definition just slightly to include some areas for the Moscatel grape, and that's going to be in those two towns, Chipiona and Chiclana de la Frontera. So they are now including that in the Jerez Superior. Also, there are some other styles that they are including in the aging. Fino Viejo or Manzanilla Pasada. These are Finos or manzanillas that have been aged for at least seven years. It used to be just, oh, that seems like it's been seven years. Now you have to age it for seven years. And the Consejo Regulador will allow you to use manzanilla pasada or fino viejo. I've never had an aged fino or manzanilla, but these could be kind of interesting. Also, unfortified sherry wines from the PDO of Jerez are now going to be legal. But if you read... A little more from the Consejo Regulador, the restrictions on yields, on alcohol levels, on a lot, it's probably not going to be very common to see unfortified sherry wines. They do make dry young wines in the sherry region for the locals to drink, but they are not PDO wines. They're not of a protected designation of origin. These unfortified sherry wines would be, but again, probably not going to be a huge part of the category. Then again, you never know. Right now, you'll see Palomino. It will be from Cadiz or it will be from some of the surrounding areas, but it's not going to be from Sherry. But in the future, we may see that. And then, like a lot of places, they are looking at some pre phylloxera great varieties. Some people are growing Beba, Peruno, and Vigiriega. Those are three grapes that are allowed. There are more that may be coming down, and that might change some of the style may make it kind of interesting. Those are the updated regulations. Again, I see why the Consejo Regulador has not updated the content because a lot of times there are things in the legal documents that you're allowed to do, but most people don't do. They're not going to use some of the regulations that are in there. So they put them in because they've been requested by people in the DO. But will they all be used? Probably not. Probably people will want to use some of those Viejo styles, the Posada styles. Are they going to want to use the new grapes? Some will, some won't. So we'll just have to see. That is Sherry. I know that you miss MCIs. I'm sorry for that. But I think this is a lot tighter and easier to understand. And with a topic that is so complicated... I think it's really important that I just give you the straight up information. Look, there are many more details on Sherry. If you go there, if you study it, if you decide to really dork out on it, you can learn many more details about it. But I think that this is enough to get you started. The other thing that I would recommend is going back and listening to the episode, which I will link to, with Andrew Sinclair of Tio Pepe, because he talks about some of the differences between sherry producers, some of the history. Tio Pepe is one of the oldest producers. It's certainly one of the most famed in the region. And that can be a really nice compliment to these two shows. Go check out some of these wines. I know that they're a little esoteric. If you can find them by the glass, I would recommend that. The other thing I didn't mention is God love the mixologist and bartenders because they have made carrying sherry kind of mandatory now. There are a lot of sherry-based drinks. So even if you don't love sherry, if you want to take a step into sherry and you see a sherry cocktail on a menu, I think that's a great way to start getting your hands around 
what these wines might taste like in the context of a drink. And if you like that, then maybe you can take some of the mixing ingredients out and just try sherry straight up. But if it weren't for the mixologist, I'm not sure where sherry would have gone, but they really did a great job of getting wines into the hands of people. Thank you to the mixologist. We all owe them a debt of gratitude for keeping sherry alive and then allowing us to come in and try it and give it another look. I'm not saying that the generosos de licor are bad, but when that's your impression and you prefer dry wines, it's hard to imagine that sherry is so much more than that. So give it a try. Let me know what you think. Uh, Like I said, MC Ice and I are big fans of Amontillado. That's usually what we drink, but I had a Fino this week and it was was actually a Tio Pepe and it was a fantastic wine. I really enjoyed it. I hope that my solo mission on this paid off and that now you're really clear on Sherry. And with that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening and we will catch you next time with MC Ice.